Assalamu alaikum, my name is Abdul Samad and I am a junior in high school right now. Uh, today, I stand before you and have the honor to present to you a great and esteemed scholar. I was actually told this about an hour ago, so I don't really have a fancy speech prepared for you. But I will try to do my best to present this scholar with the honor that he should be presented with. Bufti Hussein Kamani was born in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, so he is an American race scholar. With the blessings and du'as and supplications of his parents, Mufti Hussein Kamani underwent a journey of a lifetime in which he pursued the sacred Islamic knowledge. Now, this pursuit led him to the Islamic sciences at a very young age, and he began this at the age of six by memorizing the entire Quran at the acclaimed Darul Ulum Madania in Buffalo, New York. Now, by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was able to complete this momentous task in 1999. Having the growing thirst to quench even more knowledge, Mufti Hussein Kamani then traveled across the world to the UK, um, where he, to attain an even more advanced knowledge in the field of Islamic theology. He studied at Darul Ulum in Burri and the renowned seminary of the great revivalist and scholar of Hadith, Shaykhul Hadith Zakaria Khandawi, Rahmatullahi. Mufti Ikamani completed the traditional six year course covering the Arabic language, Arabic morphography, traditional Islamic jurisprudence, tafsir of the Holy Quran. Um, he under, and he, this was all done under the guidance of some of the pioneering scholars in England, um, which include Sheikh Yusuf Matalla, Sheikh Hashim, Sheikh Bilal, and Sheikh Abdul Rahim bin Dawood, amongst others. Now, upon graduation, Mufti Kamani was, the spe was specially selected to enter a postgraduate level course in Islamic law and law verdicts, otherwise known as fatwa. And he completed this course in just two years and received formal authorization in, uh, in it as well. Following his graduation with top honors, Mufti Kamani went to earn his postgraduate degrees in business and management and strategy at the University of Coventry, or the RDI. Currently, Mufti Hussein Kamani is the Imam of the Islamic Center of Chicago, and with the help of Allah, he is constantly working on projects. In these projects and programs that cater not only to the need of the Muslim youth, but also to the general or greater Chicago community. This includes conducting numerous uh, weekly lectures, holding after-school Quran classes, counseling youth, couples, and adults in general, teaching new Muslims, giving dawah to the non-Muslims, and being a senior advocate for the halal awareness and integrity. Mufti Hussein Kamani is also an instructor in the sacred learning um, program headed by Sheikh Hussein Abdul Sattar and is a, fav uh, and is a favorite at Darul Hikmah's um, Weekend Islamic Sciences Academy. He's also a part of the Sharia Board's Fatwa Department, and he's one of the scholars that has accompanied a Hajj group, uh, that accompanies a Hajj group by Sacred Hajj. He's a well-renowned scholar known throughout the nation. I have had the honor and the privilege to actually <coughs> sit through multiple of his lectures and listen to his words of wisdom. So today, it is actually a great honor to present to you Mufti Hussain Kamani. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihi ladhin astafa khususan ala sayyidi rusuli wa khatamil anbiya wa ala alihi laskiya wa ashabihi latqiya amma ba'd fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim bismillahi r-rahman r-rahim al-yawm akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam dina sadaqallahu al-azim when we study the life of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it is extremely important that we don't study it just as a story. We don't view the life of the messenger as superficial, something beyond our reach. When we study the life of the messenger, وسلم, it is important that we study it with the intention to bring it into our lives and so that we can act upon it. Otherwise, there is no benefit in studying this knowledge. Whenever we study the life of the Prophet, and this is extremely important, right? And the, the people that lived during the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, this is one of the issues they had with the Prophet وسلم. They saw him as an ordinary person. They didn't see him as a role model, someone unique. And that's why they said, 
Why are we going to follow this person right here? He's a normal man. He walks in the streets. He eats food like we do. He's nothing special. Why should we follow him? Why, not? why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send an angel? The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send an angel with this message was because then we would claim that he is superficial. Right? He is you know, super spiritual. And as an angel, it's possible and easy for him to act upon the deen. And I don't have a human being as a role model to follow. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his unique message was this, that anything that he taught, he acted upon it too. That's why we don't only have a written tradition of the deen, but we have an oral tradition of the deen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that anything you teach, make sure you act it out for them. Therefore we're told, not only to listen to the messenger, not only to read his words, but to do ittiba'. And ittiba', this is a common word that's used in the Quran, which is loosely translated as, you know, to follow someone. The root letters of this word ittiba' are taba'in, tabi'un. And tabi'un is actually a small baby animal. And the reason why this word to follow is derived from this other word, which means a small baby animal, is because when an animal is born, it does exactly what its mother does. Kind of like monkey see, monkey do. Whatever the animal does, whatever the mother does, the baby will do exactly that. That's why that mother has to be careful that she doesn't run too quickly. That's why that mother has to be careful that she doesn't jump over a lake because that baby will do that. It won't think twice. It's going to do exactly what its mother did. And if the mother did a large jump, right, a, a long jump, which a baby can't do, the baby will make the jump and where is it going to land? Right inside that water. So that mother must be very careful of what it does. That's why we're told to do ittiba, follow the Messenger wasallam. right? Our deen is not only a written tradition, where something you pick it up from a book and you just read it and you smile and you say, wow, that was an amazing story, let's put this away. Our deen is an oral tradition, that we see what our Messenger did. We read what our Messenger did. That's why the companions, very few of them narrate hadith saying that I read this in the book of the Prophet wasallam, or I read this and I read that. Their account of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was right. Samiyatu Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yaqul. I heard him saying this. Raaitu Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, yusalli kada or yatawadda kada. That I saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praying in this manner or doing wudu in this manner because this was very important to them. That our deen doesn't only remain. At, it's not only an academic faith where you just read it and that's it. Our deen is a faith that you implement it. That's why when you look at the first verse revealed in the Quran. What's the first word revealed? Iqra. Your oral tradition is right there. This is all about the oral tradition. This is an ummi nation. We don't read or write. The nations of the past were the Ahlul Kitab. They used to read and write. They were the written nation. We are an oral nation. We don't read or write. We are an unlettered nation. And yet, we do use writing for our text, but only to preserve it, not as the actual source. So for those young men and women who love sitting behind their computers and sit on their keyboards and they're, mashallah, the mujtahideen of Google and mujtahideen of YouTube who are doing a lot of ishtihad and a lot of ifta, you know, online and going on and bashing everyone, what do they call them? The, the, web, the, the web crusaders, right? The web crusaders, right? Out there and battling with everyone. We want to tell you something. That this deen is not something that's learned only through books. This deen is learned through being in the company of a teacher. Had it been learned through books, then Wallahi al-Azim, our messenger was smart to read a book. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even sent him a teacher, Jibreel alayhi salam. And not only did he learn from Jibreel alayhi salam, but Jibreel alayhi salam squeezed him three times, very, very carefully. And each time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam felt that he was going to die, transferring that knowledge from heart to heart, heart to heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't prevent us from reading. He gave us the option to read. But the primary source of learning the deen is through observation. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Young guys, they call all the time. Two nights ago, I was at home. 11.30, I was about to go to sleep and I get a phone call. And I answered the call that said, yes, brother. He said, I'm calling from Canada. I said, okay, how can I help you? So he said, Sheikh, how do you gain ihsan in salah? How do you gain ihsan in your salah? So I said to him, brother, you're very sincere in your question, but there are times to call with particular questions and there are times to call with particular questions. If you ask me, how do you gain ihsan in sleeping, I'll show you right now. You're asking me how to gain ihsan in salah, and I'm about to lie down in my bed. Right? Khair, anyway, so we started this conversation and we started going on this. And I explained to him that ihsan is a high level of spirituality. And this high level of spirituality, which can in other words also be referred to as taqwa, right? the high level of 
consciousness of Allah, which then manifests itself in the form of ihsan. This is gained through companionship. This is gained through being in the company of someone who has it. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah, wa kunu ma'as sadiqin. Right? All those who believe, be God conscious, and be with the righteous and the pious people. Because this deen is gained through suhbah. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they didn't just read books. They are called companions. We don't call them the scholars. We don't call them the students. We don't call them the muftis. We don't call them the mujtahideen, the mufassirin, muhadithin, fuqaha. When we call the people who lived during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what do we refer to them as? Sahaba. sahaba. What is the, what's the definition of a sahabi? Someone who has companionship. Today in America, the biggest tragedy that we have is that everyone wants to be a scholar without companionship. That's the big problem. The problem is everyone wants to be a scholar. They say, where can I go and get a one-year crash course and become a scholar? Where can I go and do a two-year crash course and become big time real quick? Where can I do an online course and really hit it quick? I want to become the next khatib. I want to give the next tafsir class. I want that sheikh to be out of there because I'm going to oust him. Everyone's planning to become big scholars, but no one knows the pathway of gaining that knowledge. That knowledge is gained through suhba. It's gained through being with your teacher. Because you don't only learn the, 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 the deen through its written tradition. The written tradition is only a part of our deen strictly for the sake of preservation. Strictly for preservation. During the life of the Prophet wasallam, none of the sciences were written down. Nothing. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq he initiated, he initiated the formal copy to be written down during his Khilafah. And then later on, Umar bin Abdul Aziz ordered that the hadith should be written down. And later on, Imam Hanifa rahmatullahi student, Imam Muhammad rahmatullahi he wrote fiqh down. And then the scholars of Kufa wrote qiraat down. They begin to write it down only as a fear of preservation. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh, the only reason why he actually even compiled the Qur'an in a written form, what was the reason? Because the battle of Yamama took place. And after the battle of Yamama against Musaylam al-Kadhab, many Sahaba were killed who had memorized the Qur'an. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh feared that maybe the preservation, maybe someone will make a false allegation against the preservation of the Qur'an, so we will not write it down. It was strictly for, 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 for preservation purposes. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He brings the written tradition in the Qur'an, He brings it the fourth verse. That came forth. The first verse that came was Iqra. But don't only read. Because when you read, when you go to read, you have to understand you can easily be misguided too. When you read, you don't only read Iqra, Bismi Rabbik. You learn the deen in the name of the Lord. You don't just learn the deen to feed your own desires and feed your own whims. Because many of us, when we learn the deen, we learn it with hidden agendas. Shaykh Ashraf Faritani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said something very profound. He said that there are four types of people who follow the deen. How many types of people? Four types of people. He goes, the first type of deen that people follow is what we call deen of mizaji. The second is what we call deen of riwaji. The third is what we call deen of shari'i. And the fourth is what we call deen of haqiqi. He says there are four types of people who follow the deen. The first person, his deen is what we call deen of mizaji. Deen of mizaji, you know what that is? Whatever I want. The deen is going to be what I want it to be. Right? I want this. Okay, Sheikh, please, this $50 note, can you please tailor me a fatwa? Right? It's kind of like we're going to the tailor to get a kurta stone or something, right? I want this done, can you please give me a fatwa here? They call it fatwa shopping. They'll go fatwa shopping, find exactly what they need for their deen to make them happy because their deen is actually based off their whims and their desires. The second type of people, they act upon their deen not based only off their desires, but they act upon it based off their culture. And we talked about this earlier on in the, in the university where the lecture was, where I was talking about how today deen has been hijacked by culture. As long as our deen matches our culture, alhamdulillah, everyone's happy. But the second deen contradicts our culture, which side of the line are we on? That's the question. Are we on the side of culture or are we on the side of deen? Last night, one young man was sitting with me. And he said to me, Shaykh, I'm getting married next year. And I'm having a very tough time right now. I said, what's the tough time you're having? He said, finally I found someone to marry and she's a beautiful girl, amazing sister, I'm very happy with her. <coughs> but the issue is that she refuses to hold a divider in the marriage. I want the men to be on one side, the sister should be on another side. But she refuses, no, it's going to be a mixed gathering. I said, okay, is there any other issue? He says that she is insisting that music will be played. So then I said, okay, look, music being played or not, mixed gathering or not, does she acknowledge these things are halal? Or does he, uh, haram or does she consider them halal? He goes, no, she knows they're haram. She knows they're haram. Everyone knows the haram. It's kind of like, you know, saying the sun is going to rise tomorrow morning. Everyone knows these things are haram, 
right? But the reason why, I said, why is she saying that she wants these things in? He said, because culturally, her family and my family will never accept this marriage then. It's an eye-opener for us. And maybe most of us sitting here right now, you know, we fall into this category. You know, the deen didn't come so we can boss and bully the deen around. Wallahi, that wasn't the purpose of the deen. The deen came to subdue our intellect, to humble us as creation in front of the Creator. That's the maqsad of wahi. The purpose of wahi isn't to twist the wahi and twist its arm the way we want it to be. The purpose of wahi is that we twist ourselves down in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we say in return, Samirna wa atana, that oh Allah, we have heard this, and oh Allah, we will be obedient and we will act upon what you say. This is a very important introduction right here. It's very important. And then, okay, let me finish off these four things and I'll start off where we, from where we need to go on. The third type of deen, Sheikh Ashraf Ali Tani rahimahullah ta'ala says, is what he, call, what he calls deen as shari'i. So the first type of people, they act upon their deen based off their nafs. The second type of people act upon their deen based off their culture. The third type of people, they act upon the deen based off halal and haram. What's haram they'll do, what's haram they'll stay away from. They'll go to the shaykh and say, is it halal? He'll say, yes, they'll do it. Is it sunnah? He'll say, brother, is, it, is this permissible? He'll say, it's not far of the but it's sunnah. Okay, I don't need to do that. Right? They'll act upon the halal and stay away from the haram. So for them, the deen is just like a law book. You do what you're told to do, you stay away from what you're told to stay away from. Then he says, however, the real deen is what he calls deen al-haqiqi. Deen al-haqiqi is where you don't play the law game against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, your life is an exact copy of that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every single thing he did, every single thing he said, the way he ate, the way he sat down, the way he dealt with people, you literally mimic every action of his. Until the point where the Sahaba were such, so great at this, they were so perfect at doing this, that a visitor would come inside the gathering of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sitting in that gathering. And the Sahaba are sitting in that gathering. And you know what question this person asks? If someone comes in this gathering and says, who is the Shaykh? Right? Due to this beautiful coat and nice big turban and beautiful beard and mashallah, you know, put on another 50, 60 pounds. And there's no problem. Everyone will know that's the Shaykh right there. Right? The Shaykh is the guy that's sitting at the front. He looks very, mashallah, proper. It's very easy to spot out your scholars. Honestly, it's not hard at all. Right? Now this person comes to the gathering of the Prophet wasallam. If you walked inside a room where the Prophet was sitting, Honestly, how long do you think it would take you to spot him out? Nothing. You'd know it. It'd be badi. Fil badaha. You'd know that that's the messenger there. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the sahaba copied the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to such a degree that the visitor would come in the masjid and what would he ask? Ayyukum Muhammad. That was his question. Ayyukum Muhammad. Which one of you is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And they would say, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was right there. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq when he completed the migration with the Prophet and when they arrived in Medina Munawwara, they arrived in Quba, they stayed there for a few days, they prayed the first Jumu'ah Salah on the way to Medina Munawwara, and after that, when they arrived in Medina Munawwara, the people of Medina Munawwara came to receive them. Right? And what happened was that they were waiting for the Prophet and the Prophet arrived a little late because the people of Medina Munawwara, they were waiting for the Prophet to arrive. And every morning after Fajr Salah, they would sit there all the way until Dhuhr time. And when Dhuhr time would come in, it would be too hot. So they would return back home, pray Dhuhr Salah, and the next day they would come after Fajr Salah again to wait for the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, when he arrived with Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, they arrived at a time where everyone just left. It was afternoon time, and everyone just went back home, and no one was there to greet them. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, when they arrived, there was one Jewish man, he was sitting in a tree, Abdullah bin Salam. Later on he became Muslim, radiallahu an. He began to scream, oh, the man you're waiting for just came. So everyone came running back to meet the Prophet Now when they arrived there, meanwhile, the Prophet and Abu Bakr Siddiq they sat down. And when everyone came, they're like, who's the Prophet? Which one's the Prophet? Is it Abu Bakr or is it Muhammad Because they copied him to such a degree. They literally became mirror images of the Prophet And when Abu Bakr Siddiq saw this, that people were confused, he immediately stood up, he took his upper garment and he began to shade the Prophet from the sun. To show who is the khadim and who is the makhdum. Who was a servant and who was the one being serviced. And then people saw, oh, that's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the nation that we need. That's the people, that's the type of people we need. People who submit themselves to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now when we study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to understand that he is the perfect role model. So keeping in the context all the stuff I said, you and I can't sit here and, and dictate what the deen is. You know the most saddest thing that I have seen in my life and that I see happen again and again 
is when we're sitting together at a dinner table at someone's house and we're discussing a fiqh issue or a, the, uh, a matter of the deen and random people start saying, this is my opinion. It really upsets me. The reason why it upsets me is because it feels like you would never have the audacity to make such a statement in the gathering of lawyers and you would say, this is my opinion, this is what the state law should be. Right? You would sound like a fool. You're sitting in front of guys who fight the UFC and you say, you know what, my opinion is that the headlock should be this way. You guys say, Pindu, get out of here, man. What are you talking about? What do you know about this? What do you know about fighting? You go and, you know, you go cook your roti at home. And now we have people in our community who want to share their opinion regarding the deen. If you've studied the deen, if you have qualifications in the deen, then marhaban bikum, of course. Then what, what, what more are we waiting for? We should have discussion. Discussion is very healthy. It's a great part of our deen. We don't just, you know, hijack the mimbar and say, this is my opinion. We always have discussion. This is a part of our rich tradition, our legacy. But we only accept we only accept discussion, we only accept input from those people who have some sort of expertise in the field. Right? So most of us, we want to sit down and say, this is what the deen is. For some people, we've defined deen as whatever happens in the masjid. Outside the masjid, it's nothing to do with the deen. Whatever happens in the masjid is deen. For certain people, the deen is just having a good heart. What do they say? You have a good heart, Allah will take care of everything else. Don't worry about it. Brother, you want to drink some sharab, just drink it. You want to eat haram kebab, drink, eat this too. Whatever you want, do enjoy your life, right? You just have, make sure you have a good heart. And then mashallah, every group has their support from the Qur'an. إِلَّا مَنَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Everyone brings their dalil. Everyone does. You know, you know the khawarij? They hated Ali radiallahu anh. The reason why they hated Ali radiallahu anh is because Ali radiallahu anh, we were talking about this earlier on today too. They hated Ali radiallahu anh. The reason why they hated him was because Ali radiallahu anh gave a verdict that they didn't like. He decided to postpone the revenge of the murder of Uthman radiallahu anh. The Khawarij didn't like that, they got very mad. So they said that Ali radiallahu anh is giving a verdict against the Qur'an and, and if he's giving a verdict against the Qur'an, that means he's a kafir, which means he's wajibul qatil. So we have to go kill Ali radiallahu anh. Look, look, look at this logic, it's so foolish, right? And then when they were called to discussion, they actually supported their view from the ayat of the Qur'an. And which ayat of the Qur'an did they use? In al hukmu illa lillah. That there is no judgment but that which belongs to Allah. And Ali radiallahu anh is giving judgment against Allah's word, that's where we're going to kill him. And Ali radiallahu anh, when he heard this, what did he say? He said, Kalimatu haqqin urida biha al-batil. That their statement is right. The verse of the Quran he's quoting is authentic hadith, mashallah. It's an authentic verse of the Quran. No one's going to doubt that at all. But the meaning you're taking from this verse of the Quran is completely false. And then these people, they made the plan. Three of them gathered together on the 17th of Ramadan inside the Haram. And they made a plan to kill. Three great people, Amr ibn As radiallahu an, Mu'abiya radiallahu an, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and the one who was assigned to kill Ali radiallahu an, his name was Ibn Muljim. Ibn Muljim, he then arrived in Medina Munawwara, and each of these people went their own ways in Syria and different places, wherever these three men were, because they were going to do a triple assassination at the same time. They had made a day that this day will be the assassination day. It will happen while the person leaves his house in the morning on the way to Fajr Salah. And Ibn Muljim, he stood outside the house of Ali radiallahu anh, and as soon as Ali radiallahu anh came out, he whacked Ali radiallahu anh right on the head. And he split his head into pieces. And later on that day, the Ali radiallahu anh, he passed away from this. You know, within a few hours that day, Ali radiallahu anh passed away. So everyone has their support from the deen. MashaAllah, we're very good at that. We're very good at quoting things out of context and supporting ourselves and making our way strong, you know, so we can have a good presentation in front of people. But that shouldn't be the point. The point should be that when you study the deen, understand it through the tradition of the Prophet So some people they like defining the deen as whatever takes place in the masjid. Some people like defining the deen that the deen is whatever takes place in the heart. That's it. But we don't realize that the deen is beyond that. The deen is very wide. And the deen doesn't only want us to be good inside the masjid, but it also wants us to be good outside the masjid. The deen doesn't only want us to be good inside the market, the deen wants, to be, wants us to be good as teachers. The Prophet ﷺ not only taught us how to be good outside the house, he taught us how to be perfect role models inside the house. And this was the beautiful thing about the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Usually these things are taught by the parents. Who teaches a child to be so perfect in every aspect? Whose responsibility is that usually? The parents. But for the Prophet ﷺ, he grew up without parents. And his tarbiyah, his upbringing was done directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Jibreel alayhi salam. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's tarbiyah was the most excellent. His tarbiyah was perfect, his upbringing was perfect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then praised 
The Prophet sallallahu by saying, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That indeed you are on the sublime character, you have the perfect character. The people would come to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Right? The Prophet sallallahu told us that if you want to gauge a person's character, don't look at them outside the house, look at them inside the house. Find out how they are inside the house. Because outside the house is very easy to put on a smile, wave at everyone, put on nice garments, put on good perfume, everyone you meet, give them a big smile, hug them. You could be seen as an amazing person outside the house. But as soon as that person enters inside the house, then what happens to that person is a secret within itself. This mashallah, Sufi pious person turns into this big zalim jabbar, you know, maybe the, the mentor of Hajj Ajbin Yusuf. He turns into this great oppressor. That's how bad we turn as soon as we enter inside the houses. You want to find out the real value of a person, you ask their family. And not only their children, not only the family, because in the family you have children. Ask their wife, the people they've taken for granted. Ask their mother, ask their father, and then ask them, what do you think of your son? What do you think of your daughter? What, how is your husband? How is your wife? How is your child? How is your father? And then these people will tell you the real side of things. Then you'll find out who a person really is. The companions wanted to know about the Prophet ﷺ. And those people who were deprived of seeing the Prophet ﷺ with their eyes, they wanted to hear about him. They would come to Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha anha, And they would ask her, that tell us about the Prophet ﷺ. This is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. And they're asking her after the Prophet ﷺ has passed away, that speak to us about him. And Aisha anha starts crying. She cries and cries and cries. Just by hearing his name, she's in tears. That's what you call a husband. That's what you call love. That just the word, just the name of your husband enters into your ears and you're in tears. And it was the vice versa. The Prophet ﷺ had equivalent love for his wives too. His wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, and she was so dear and so close to him. She was the only wife who he lost during his lifetime. The other wives, they lived till he passed away. The one wife who he lost, lost in his life was Khadija radiallahu anha. And it was so hard on him, so hard on him because he was a prophet but he was attached to his family. Right? He was attached to his wives. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the first revelation comes. He's worried, he's shook it up, he's shaking, he's trembling. It's such a big day on him, right? The wahi inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal fa abayna an yahmilha wa ashfaqna minha. No other creation can hold the weight of this berry. Right? That can hold the weight of this wahi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلْ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ A mountain couldn't hold the weight of revelation. And here the soft and tender heart of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes the first verses of, of revelation. And as the mountain would shake, he's also shaking. He arrives home, and who does he go to first? Does he go to his boys and chat with them? Does he go to some other family members or relatives? Where's the first place the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes after the first revelation? He comes right home. Because the person who he loved most, and the person who he knew that their hug and their sheet would calm him down, was his wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. <clears throat> That's what kind of family man he was. And my teacher used to say, Revelation started in the arms of Khadija and ended in the lap of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. It started in one wife's arms and ended in one wife's lap. That was how the Prophet ﷺ was with his wives. And just by hearing Khadija radiallahu anha's name, he would start crying. Just by seeing some resemblance of her, it would bring tears to his eyes. The Prophet ﷺ, he had... Anyone know how many sons the Prophet ﷺ had? Three. Very good, mashallah. How many daughters did he have? Four. This is a good crowd, mashallah. He had three, three daughters and... No, sorry. Three sons and four daughters. Right? The oldest daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, what was her name? Zainab. MashaAllah, very good. Zainab, very good. And she was married to? <laughs> I'm waiting for you guys to trip. <laughs> Abu al-As. Who was she married to? Abu al-As. And Abu al-As was the son of Khadija radiallahu anha's sister. Khadija radiallahu anha's sister, her son's name was Abu al-As. And Zainab radiallahu anha married her. So they, Zainab radiallahu anha, who did she marry her? Her cousin. Her mother and her husband's mother were actually sisters. Okay, so she married her her cousin. Her cousin Abu Al-As didn't accept Islam, and he came to fight against the Muslims in the Battle of Badr, and he was captured by the Muslims. And the Prophet wasallam, after the Battle of Badr, he sat down with his companions and he asked them that what should we do with these captives? Umar radiAllahu an said, "Slay them all." Abu Bakr Siddiq radiAllahu an said, "Let them free in return of ransom." 
the Prophet وسلم, took the opinion of Abu Bakr Siddiq and he announced that anyone whose relative we've captured at the Battle of Badr, you may take them back home in return of a ransom. Right? And those who had skill were held back in Makkah Mukarramah to Medina Munawwara to teach that skill to the people of Medina Munawwara. Now everyone came one by one to give the ransom to free their family members. And Zainab anha also came. She came to free her husband, Abu Ras. And when it came time for her to give the ransom, they said to her, give her something, give us something. The Sahabi said, you have to give something in order to take your husband. And she took off her necklace and she gave it. And when that necklace was bought in front of the Prophet when he was going through all the things, when he saw that necklace, he picked it up and he started crying. And he cried and cried and cried. And one Sahabi asked, O Messenger of Allah, what makes you cry? The Prophet said that this necklace Khadija used to wear. And she gave it to my daughter Zainab at the time of her marriage. And I know Zainab just gave this right now to free her husband Abu al-As. He started crying just by seeing a resemblance of Khadija radiallahu anha. A, some, a leftover artifact of, of Khadija radiallahu anha makes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa cry. That's what kind of husband he was. He was a perfect man inside the house. The Aisha radiallahu anha says that when he was inside the house, it was as if he had nothing else to worry about in life. He was in the family. And then when it was time for salah, he would just get up, lead, get up and leave and go pray salah and come back and he would sit with us. So when he was at home, it wasn't like he was imposing himself, oh, I'm a big sheikh, I'm a big mufti, you come here to this for me, you come here to that for me. He was just a normal husband. We love being in his company. The Prophet ﷺ, he had a great time with his wives. As Aisha anha, she says, that before the Prophet ﷺ would leave the house, many times before he would leave, he would kiss me on the cheek and then he would leave. And the Hanafi scholars, they use this hadith as their dalil to say that the touching of a lady with a man's skin does not break the wudu. They use this hadith as their proof. They say that the Prophet ﷺ would kiss Aisha on the cheek before going to lead salah. And you look at this, where do you find a husband like this? Where do you find a man who's so complete, who has such good recommendation from everyone in the community, where everyone's saying this man was amazing. You want to learn the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's not be, let's not nitpick and choose what we're going to, what we're going to take from his life. Let's take the whole picture. Everyone wants to talk about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had ten wives and he had eleven wives and he had this and he had that. The critics always use this as a target to attack Islam, but they don't talk about how he treated those ten wives. Does anyone ever talk about that? Does anyone ever talk about how each of those ten wives never married again after he sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away because of his love? Anyone ever talk about that? Anyone ever talk about when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to sit next to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and he would eat from the same plate as her? Where in Arab society that was considered as something bad for a husband, a man to sit on the, eat on the same plate as a lady? He would sit down and eat with his wives. And not only eat with them, he would sit next to them and eat. And he would put a morsel in their mouth and they would put a morsel in his mouth. And Aisha radiallahu anha says that one day I was eating with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And while I was eating with him, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he gave me a cup of water and I drank from there. And after I drank from there, I put the cup down. The Prophet Wasallam picked up that very same cup and he began to spin it. He was looking for my lip marks. And then he drank from the exact same place where I drank from. You want to roam, you, you want love, look at Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a perfect, well-rounded man. And the Prophet Wasallam wasn't harsh and mean with his women. The Prophet Wasallam was having a dinner with two, his, two of his wives, right? Majma'u Zawaid. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is having that's a reference. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is having a meal with two of his wives, and they're both eating. And one says to the other, "You eat first. The second says, "No, you eat first." She says to her, "You eat first." She says, "I don't care. No, you're going to eat first." So this one says, "If you don't eat first, I'm going to put food on your face." And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sitting right where? He's sitting in the middle, and they're going off at each other, like firing each other down. Typical women. <laughs> so one of them picks up some food and puts it on her face. She did it in front of the Prophet And the Prophet Now this lady says, look what she just did, put food on my face, tatter tell. She just put food on my face right now. And the Prophet what did he do? He just moved his chest back. That's it, he just moved his chest back and she took food and put it back on her face. What is that? sayyatin sayyatun mithruha. If someone is wrong to you, you have the right to do it back to them. Right? But that was the humor of the Prophet ﷺ. That's how he was with his family. He was always smiling. He was always smiling and laughing and joking. He's racing with Aisha radiallahu anha. When how old is he at that time? He's over 55 years old almost. Right? And some narration he was 53 years old. Right? He's returning back from a battle 
He couldn't be 53 because that battle took place after the battle of Badr, right? He was over 55 years old and he's racing. Which 55 year old man today can race his wife? Right? Without falling over with a heart attack. Let me add that clause. Who can do that today? No one can. The Prophet was so humble that he lets her win. And then after a few years later, he says to Aisha, let's race again. And they race again. And the Prophet beats Aisha. And then he says to her, the first time I let you win too. Don't think you beat me. He was so humble. His wife Aisha says, the Messenger of Allah, there's, there's a street. They're, they're playing sports in the streets. I want to go watch it. I want to go watch the game. The Prophet said, he stands at the door and Aisha she gets on her tippy toes and she's peeking over the shoulder of the Prophet. Imagine how beautiful that scene was. What a husband he was. She's standing there and the Prophet the Hadith says, the Prophet says that I had no interest in that game at all. What they were watching, it was like watching cricket. I had no interest. What are these guys doing, right? I'm watching these guys do this crazy thing here. And my, his wife is, you know, she, but he's only standing there because his wife wants to watch it. Right? As Aisha is watching, the Prophet is standing. We can give so many examples, so many examples of how the Prophet dealt with his wives and how he was a perfect husband. The wives of the Prophet were amazed by him. They were amazed by his sublime character. And it wasn't only his wives. The Prophet gave that equal attention to his children too. Fatima was the perfect role model. Anytime she had an issue, you know, you want to find out how good of a parent a person was, you see who they go to at the time of difficulty. When your son is facing a problem, when your daughter is facing a problem, check who they go to first. And trust me, if your child doesn't come to you with a problem for the past three months, they're not coming to you. Do you understand? They're going to someone else. Because children face a lot of problems. They're emotionally going through a lot. And if they haven't come to you in the past six, seven months with a big issue they're facing, they're probably not coming to you. They're probably going to someone else, some friend of theirs, and the, the advisor, probably has no better wisdom than that child has himself. And that's where you see our children making these crazy you know, mistakes they make in their lives. Uh, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala on the other hand, any, any issue she had, who would she come to first? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She would go there directly. When she got married, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked her, Fatima, we will, preserve, we will get ready for you the house. Where do you want to stay? Where do you wish to stay in Madinah Manora? Because we will have a house ready for you. And where did Fatima radiallahu say, oh my, oh my father, I want to live right now next to you. Where do you find a daughter like this today? That says to her father that I want to live next door to you. You know, daddy's girl. She was so close to the Prophet And she was that close to him throughout his entire life. And the Prophet when he's passing away, he knows that his daughter won't be able to bear the separation. So that's why he tells his daughter Fatima that after I pass away, you will be the first person to come and join me. You're going to pass away soon too. We're going to be together in Jannah. Sayyidatun Nisa'i Fatima. Right, Sayyidatul Nisa'i Ahl al-Jannah. Fatima, Sayyidatul Nisa'i Ahl al-Jannah. Fatima will be the leader of the women in Jannah. And the Prophet so that's him being a father. That's him being a husband. And then that's him there being a father. And then the Prophet وسلم, because his other daughters, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, they had passed away. The three sons, Abdullah, Qasim and Ibrahim had also passed away. Right? So Fatima radiallahu anha, she was by the side of the Prophet وسلم, throughout the entire life. And then after this, the grandchildren of the Prophet ﷺ, who were infants, how did the Prophet ﷺ deal with them? The Prophet ﷺ, whenever he had his grandchildren around him, he couldn't stop kissing them. He couldn't stop. And in the hadith, is in Adab al-Mufrad, Imam Bukhari he brings the hadith, that one companion saw the Prophet ﷺ kissing the child on his forehead. And he said, a Messenger of Allah, I have 10 kids, I've never kissed them, why are you kissing your child? And the Prophet ﷺ said, it's not my fault, you don't have rahmah and mercy in your heart. It's not my fault you don't have raham and mercy. I love my children. And he kissed them on the forehead again. The Prophet is giving the khutbah. And these two young children, they enter inside the, inside the masjid. And by the way, the Prophet was the best khatib. He was an amazing speaker. And he was the most prestigious speaker to ever stand on the mimba in the, in, in, in the history of mankind. He's giving this amazing khutbah. And while he's giving this khutbah, these two young children come inside and they're falling. And the Prophet when he sees them falling, he stops the khutbah. He goes over there, he picks them up. He sits down again and then he recites the verse of the Quran, Innama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna wallahu indahu ajr nadim. That indeed your wealth and children are a test from Allah and Allah will reward you abundantly. I can honestly go on with example after example after example. The point I want to make is that where the Prophet ﷺ was an amazing worshiper, he was an amazing worshiper. We can have a whole seminar just on his worship. Books were written on the ibadah of the Prophet. ﷺ. Where the Prophet wasn't only worshipping with his outer actions, but also with his sincerity. 
You know, we always talk about the difference of opinion within fiqh. Someone says, tie the hands here. 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 Everyone's diff you know, fighting over where to tie the hands. I went to meet Sheikh Akram Nadwi. He's a scholar in Oxford. A very, very, very knowledgeable scholar. Right? He's a doctor and he lectures in Oxford. He's written a book actually right now, which he's waiting to publish. It's on the female scholars of hadith. What's it called? The muhadithat, the female scholars of hadith. You know how many volumes that book is? Female scholars of hadith, how many do you think were around? How many volumes do you think the book is? Take a wild guess. Three, volumes. Three volumes, five volumes. The Shaykh knows. It's 52 volumes. How big is that book? 52 volumes. I sat with him and I said, Shaykh, how did you write 52 volumes? He goes, even that, I cut the book short. Otherwise, I could have written a lot more than 52 volumes. But it, I said, where's the book? He said, Yaitu Musibat, that's the big problem. No one wants to publish 52 volumes. <laughs> Literally, he said, I've been traveling the world and no one wants to publish my book. He said this to me. He said, now, so I said, what's the plan now? So he said, now my plan is that inshallah, if Allah gives me the tawfiq, I finally found a publisher in Beirut who's willing to publish the book, but even he's told me to cut the book down to 40 volumes. So he said, I'm going to have to scrap 12 volumes altogether. I'm just going to have to get rid of 12 volumes, bring the book down to 40 volumes, and publish that book. <laughs> Extremely knowledgeable man. So knowledgeable, wallahi, I can't even tell you. I was sitting with him and he said this point, And I want to relate it to you guys. Everyone talks about where the hands should be in Salah. You have to understand the Sahaba, they saw the Prophet ﷺ placing their hands in different places in Salah. That's why they narrated it that way. But one thing that, that no one differed in opinion is, right? We like engaging in the things that where there's difference of opinion. Where there's ikhtilaf, everyone likes talking about that. Everyone likes talking about where to put the hand. I mean loud, I mean silently. Do you raise your hands? Do you not raise your hands? Those are the nice discussions that you have fun because there's a good debate in there. You really don't have to do much to debate that. But no one wants to study and act upon the thing that was muttafaq amongst the Sahaba, something that was, had a consensus amongst the Sahaba, which was that wherever you put your hands in salah, the Prophet was always crying in his salah. Those tears, there is a consensus on them. There is an ijma on the tears of the Prophet But no one wants to act upon that. You understand? Because that requires a heart. That requires suhbah, that requires being in the companionship, that requires following the real role model of the Prophet And who wants to do that today? Right? The Prophet was not only a great worshipper, but he was a great warrior. Not only a great warrior, the best teacher. I was in Medina Manawara this year, and while I was walking past the front part of the masjid of the Prophet you know when you go, some of you may have been before, and when you go to say salam to the road of the grave of the Prophet you walk past the front part of the masjid. And then on the left side there is the actual masjid of the Prophet And there's also the mimbar there where the Prophet used to stand and lead salah and where, his, where he used to give the khutbah, the mihrab and the mimbar. So as I was walking past this, a thought came to my mind. I was thinking, wow, once upon a time this was a local masjid of some local people and there was a local imam in here. There was a normal guy who used to lead salah here, there was some normal musallis. But the thing was that that local imam was normal, he was one of the people. But he was so spiritually strong, so spiritually strong. And the local musalli, those who followed him were so spiritually strong too. And you know, my teacher used to always say, he says in Urdu, I'll say it in Urdu, then I'll translate it for you in English. He used to say, Us zamane mein majid kachi thi, log pakke the. Aad majid pakki ho log kachi ho This was his statement, right? He used to say, in that time, the, 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 the structure was weak, but the men were strong. Today we've made the structure strong, but the men inside the masjid have gone weak. We flipped the model over, right? So the Prophet ﷺ was an amazing imam, amazing teacher. But remember, he was as amazing as a family man. There was no part of the family of the Prophet ﷺ that was left deprived. Today, every parent is making that complaint. That my child doesn't listen to me. My child doesn't want to listen to me. I told my child, you can't marry that person, you have to marry this person. But we don't understand that when these children were growing up, we weren't there for them. For the greater part of it, we were not there for our children. Right? When these children were growing up and when they had issues and when they wanted to talk to us, when they came back home, we were in the store and these children didn't know who to go to. These children never felt that their father was anything more than a dictator in their life. That's why they never had that relationship. And today when we sit with these kids, honestly, when any kid comes to me with an issue, the first thing I ask him is that, do your parents know? One lady came, one girl came to me, and she was brought to the masjid by a priest. She actually first went to the church. Right? She first went to the church with her case, and the priest asked me that I need to consult you on her matter. 
So I said, come on in. So the priest and that girl came together, and she was a Muslim girl, by the way, okay? She came to the masjid, and I was sitting there. And I said, what's the case? And the girl said, I, have, I, I, I want to go through an abortion. I want to go through an abortion. And the reason why she was afraid to come to the masjid was because she felt that the Muslims would never accept her. The Muslims wouldn't accept her. So she went there. And then he asked me from an Islamic perspective, what's the ruling on abortion? So one thing I asked her, I said, do your parents know about this? And she said, if I tell my parents, forget aborting, forget aborting the child, they'll abort me. <laughs> forget the child, they'll just behead me, though my life will come to an end. Forget the child's life. Right? So this is the state that our parents are at today. Right? Because we're busy working and working and working and working, we've become workaholics. We think that the responsibility of the father is to only pay for the child's fees. It's a lie, man. The Prophet ﷺ didn't only pay for his children, he took care for them. He was there, everything for them. And you guys know that the Prophet ﷺ for a great part of his life was a single father. You know that, right? Yes or no? You guys, it's established, right? All of the children of the Prophet ﷺ who lived, who were they born through? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha passed away. And after she passed away, the Prophet sallallahu continued to father them all alone. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha got married in Medina Munawwara in the third year Hijri. And until then, the Prophet sallallahu kept her by his side and was a single father for her. He had other wives, but he never burdened them with that responsibility. He took care of her alone. Which father sitting here right now actually has a confidence to say that I have such an attachment with my child that I could take care of them alone as a father. I could take care of them alone as a mother. The Prophet wasallam was well-rounded. He never had big issues with his families. And if the Prophet wasallam did have marital issues, he easily dealt with them. Very easily. We were talking about this earlier on today. A lot of these things that we said earlier are coming back right now. But khair for the gathering, we'll repeat them. If you look at the life of the Prophet wasallam, did he ever have marital issues? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Of course he did. But having a marital issue, is that, a, is that something bad? Is that, a, is that something bad? It's not. There is nothing bad with having marital problems. As human beings, we will make mistakes. But the real kamal or the real beauty is how you deal with the problem. You guys understand that? What's the real beauty in life? How you deal with issues in life. So here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his entire marital life, he had small things up and down, but there were two incidents in his life which actually were major marriage issues that he had. Two times in his life where he had major marriage issues. Two major issues that the Prophet ﷺ had in his life with his marriage. There were two major incidents. What were the causes of these incidents? Okay? You know, young men, they come and ask all the time, Sheikh, I want to get married. What should I look for in a wife? Common question, right? The Imam always gets this one. When I'm getting married, what should I, ask? What should I get? You know, my teacher used to always say, that you will meet the Imam three times in your life. At your birth, at your marriage, at your death. <laughs> and I was actually amazed because I went, I went the other day with my father to a lawyer to set his will up. And he said the same thing too. What did the lawyer say? He said, people come to us at two to three times in their life. When someone's born, when someone's getting married, when someone's dying. Rather than marriage, he said divorce actually. <laughs> at least we're on the marriage side. Right? So, People ask, you know, what, what is there that I should look for in a wife? I always tell them, two things you must have in a wife. Because if you don't have these two things, your life is going to be misery with that person. What are the two things? The first thing is loyalty. The second thing is qana. Loyalty and qana. You, know you know what loyalty is, right? That you are content that your spouse is not going to look towards anyone else. Your spouse will be devoted to you and that's it. And what does qana'at mean? Anyone know what qana'at means? Content. You are content with what you're given. Just yesterday I was in Indiana. And one brother came with a situation to me. It's a very interesting situation. Where his wife started doubting him for some reason. She was doubting him. She thought that he was up to some, some badmashi. Right? For the lack of a better word. Now this guy says to me, Sheikh, I have a daughter and son that are married. I'm past that age. And my wife is doubting me. So I said, so what happened? So he said, one day we were at the office. They worked together. And she left early. When she left early, she went inside the car. Now she was gone, okay? So he said, after I was and I closed up the office and I went to my car. When I sat in the car, it goes, I closed the door and I felt like someone was in the back seat. So he said, I took the rear view mirror and I pointed it down and my wife was there. She was kneeled down like this and she was sitting there. 
So he said, I feel bad that how am I going to call her out? So he said, I put the mirror back up and I just started driving. He said, I called home and, I asked, and my, my daughter-in-law answered. I asked her, what's for dinner? She said that, whatever, we've cooked this, this. He said, has my wife arrived yet? He said, no, not yet. Now she's listening at the back. <laughs> he said, I got home. I parked far away from the house. Make her walk too. <laughs> he said, I got out, I locked the car and set the alarm. <laughs> he goes, then I had to, okay, I won't say what happened after that, okay? It gets too bad. Okay, anyway, so imagine a life like that. Where you're just not, you're not, you think your husband or your wife isn't loyal. All your life you just go here and no, maybe this, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this. And the second thing is what we call contentment, but not. Right? If you ever get married to someone who's not content with what you have to give them, they're going to take you on a roller coaster. They're going to take you on a very far roller coaster because the expectations are going to drive you nuts. And trust me, expectations never come to an end. And these were the two reasons why those two major issues took place during the life of the Prophet ﷺ in his marriage. The first one was, someone made accusations on the loyalty of Aisha radiallahu anha. And it really upset the Prophet ﷺ. And it bothered him so much, it bothered him so much, it became such a serious issue that he actually spoke to Zayd bin Haritha and Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhuma regarding what he should do. He said, what should I do now? I don't know what to do. And Ali radiallahu anh actually gave the advice, O Messenger of Allah, it may, you have permission to marry as many as women, whoever you wish to marry. marry he, he was kind of implying that maybe you can marry someone else. And this was the reason why Aisha radiallahu anh was always upset with Ali radiallahu anh. Because he gave this advice at that time. Women remember things, right? And she remembered it too. And then it, it became such a serious marriage issue that, the Prophet, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to reveal 10 ayat in Surah An-Nur for the contentment and purification of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Inna ladhina ja'u bi difki usbatum minkum. Until the end, all those ayat are there. And the second issue was where the women of the Prophet sallallahu asked for increase in their, uh, what do you call this, their nafaqa. What's the nafaqa called? Allowance. Jazakallah, right? For the increase in allowance. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we want more money from you. And the Prophet sallallahu said, I don't have anything. They said, no, we want more. And it became such a big issue that the Prophet sallallahu had to leave the house. He left the house and he didn't return back for some days. And it's a very long story of what happened. At the end of the story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayat there too. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, qul li azwajika, in kuntunna turidna al-hayatu dunya wa zinataha, fata'alayn umatti'ukunna wa usarrihkunna sarahan jameela, wa in kuntunna turidna Allah wa rasulahu wa dar al-akhirah, fa inna Allah a'adda lil-muhsanati min kunna ajan azima. Ya anis, and right till the end. These verses are the closing verses of the 21st verse of the Qur'an and the opening verses of the 22nd verse of the Qur'an. And in this verse is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He say? Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Messenger, قُلْ لِي أَزْوَاجِكَ Say to your wives, إِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِدْنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتَهَا If you want this worldly life and its beauties, فَتَعَالَيْن Come to me. أُمَتِّعُكُنَّ I will give it to you. But after I give it to you, when I have seen that you are not content with what I have to give to you, أُسَرِّحْكُنَّ صَلَاحًا جَمِيلًا I will get rid of you too. You will be gone. But not just leave, I'm going to, in a proper manner, Sarah and Jamila, in the most beautiful manner, but you will be out of the marriage. But however, in kuntunna turidna Allah wa rasulahu, if you decide to opt for Allah and the Rasul, with dar al-akhir and the hereafter, fa inna Allah a'adda lil-muhsanati min kunna ajran azima, then Allah has prepared for you a very grand and great reward in the hereafter. Right? The Prophet ﷺ did have issues sometimes with his family, but he knew how to deal with them. With patience, without screaming, without getting angry, without throwing a flower pot, without getting into, you know, punching and swinging and, and abusive. The Prophet ﷺ knew how to do all of this. And if we as Muslims want to claim to be the followers of the Prophet ﷺ, it's important that we follow his example holistically. We don't pick and choose what we will do from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Because we cannot make this deen into one based off our whims and desires. This deen cannot be one based off our culture. This deen just can't be based off halal and haram. This deen must be based off exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. If we can become good parents, if we can become good brothers, if we can be the best wives, if we can be the best husbands, then our children will also be the best too. But if the machinery inside the is faulty, how do you expect a good product to come out? Is that possible? If the machinery inside the factory is faulty, can you get a good product coming out of there? No, you can't. You have to make sure the machinery is solid. It's A quality. If we become the best parents, then watch our children come up. If we become parents who are role models for our children, where our children don't have to see us fighting and arguing with each other every time we step into the house, our children's marriages will also be safe and secure. And if we can give a nice, strong family to the ummah, 
If we can teach people how to establish real families that the Prophet ﷺ established, then we will revive within our society something that it's losing today. Because today it's very hard to find a family which can serve as a role model. With that, I end my, I end my discussion. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us all to understand this role model of the Prophet, this, this model of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that Allah subhanahu wa taala allows us all to follow His footsteps. Allah azza wa jalla allows us all to be the best fathers, the best mothers, the best brothers, the best sisters, the best husbands, the best wives. And may Allah subhanahu wa taala keep our families in the shade of His throne on the day of judgment. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Akhir da'wana. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.